<clears throat> Today is the Lord's Day, and we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. We do that once a month on the second Sunday of the month. And as I contemplated our meditation for the Lord's table today, I felt that we should turn our attention to this aspect of his death. The fact that it was substitutionary. How could we ever fully expand that portion, that aspect of our Lord's death? Think of the theology that is involved in the substitutionary death of our Lord Jesus Christ. The words are also used, the vicarious atonement. Words that say the same thing. What does it mean to be a substitute? What does it mean when we say vicarious atonement? Listen to these words. It means that it is performed or suffered by one person as a substitute for another or to the benefit or advantage of another. Vicarious atonement, vicarious sacrifice. In previous messages on the death of Christ, we have made this statement. The death of Christ is the most remarkable event of all history. Amen. Keep that in your mind. John Owen, the Puritan writer, in his exposition of Psalm 130, verse 4, This is his statement. Now herein consists the greatest work that God did ever perform or ever will. It was the most eminent product of infinite wisdom, goodness, grace, and power, and herein do all the excellencies of God shine forth more gloriously than all the works of his hands. Amen. We could think about that for a long time. The Old Testament prophets describe the promised Messiah as a person of high dignity, as one who would perform wondrous <laughs> miracles, as one who would be despised and rejected, as one who would die a death of shame and violence. That shameful and violent death is described for us in Psalm 22, please open your Bibles. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head saying, Commit yourself to the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet thou art he who didst bring me forth from the womb. Thou didst make me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon thee I was cast from birth. 
Thou hast been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan, have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a roaring, as a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up as a potsherd and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and thou dost lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lot. As I was copying these words for my sermon notes, and I came to the last part of this psalm, the words that came to my mind were these. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Was it the supernatural phenomena which attended Christ's death distinguished it from all other deaths? The sun darkened. The earth was an earthquake. The rending of the temple veil from top to bottom. All these events proclaimed that the one hanging on the cross was no ordinary sufferer. I want to make that statement again because it's, it's foundational to the point that we want to make today. All these events shouted, they claimed, they proclaimed that the one hanging on the cross was no ordinary sufferer. Because there was something going on in that suffering more than just the pain and the agony. Likewise, we could say that the events which followed his death loudly proclaimed that he was indeed the Son of God. The resurrection of his body, his bodily ascension to heaven, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit ten days later. In the New Testament, the death of Christ is set forth as, dear ones, the foundation of Christianity. Because without it, there is no Christianity. It is also, dear people, set before us this morning as the most powerful motivation to mortify sin and to pursue a life of personal holiness and practical godliness. I mentioned in the Sunday School Hour that we are in a series of mortification of sin. That's in our regular services. And one of the things that Owen deals with in that series is what is it that is going to motivate us to deal drastically with our sin, to mortify our own remaining sin. And it is this, it is a deep, thorough, penetrating understanding and application of what really happened on the cross. And until that is understood, and until that is grasped in its full meaning, as we have it in God's Word, there will be no motivation that's sufficient to cause you to cut out right eyes and to cut off right hands. It'll never happen. 
That's why it's so desperately important that the depth of the meaning of what we're dealing with is understood and that it grips our hearts. The death of Christ was the theme of apostolic preaching. And you know what? It will be the theme of heaven's praises for all eternity. Never ending. I don't want you to turn there, but I do want you to listen very, very carefully to the words found in the book of Revelation, the words of the redeemed in heaven. I'll give you the reference, Revelation 5, 11 and 12. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb, get these words, that was slain. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're attempting to understand. Those words, that was slain. What went on? What happened? And the agony and the death. And the verse finishes to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, glory and blessing. When we speak of the death of Christ, we often use the word atonement. The word atonement has to do with the satisfaction which Christ made to the just demands of God. Again, I beg your attention. In vicariously bearing the penalty due the sins of his people, as well as that vicarious obedience which Christ rendered to the precepts of the law, which is imputed to all of the elect. And the question we're dealing with is this. Was the death of Christ really a necessity? And if so, why? And in answering this question, it will be necessary for us to set forth some very basic, fundamental truths. Understanding that God's Word reveals concerning that which took place in eternity past will greatly help us to better understand what has taken place in time. And according to Ephesians chapter 1, before the foundation of the world, God set his eternal and distinguishing love upon certain sinners and determined to save them. That was an act of his own sovereign will. I think this is a truth that we don't understand, but let me share it with you. We must understand that God was not obligated to save one sinner. However, once God declared his will concerning the salvation of those whom he purposed to save, he was bound to save them. in a way that would be consistent with his divine perfections. God 
chose to save, knowing full well what it would involve. And in his infinite wisdom, he knew that only through the death of his son could satisfaction be made to his essential holiness and justice. I want to read that again. In his infinite wisdom, God knew that only through the death of his son could satisfaction be made to his essential holiness and justice. Turn with me to Hebrews 7 and verse 22. Hebrews 7, 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety. A surety of a better testament. Christ is called our surety because he agreed in the covenant of redemption to make satisfaction for those whom the Father had given him. Psalm 40 is a messianic psalm. Psalm 40 speaks of Christ being obedient even unto death. And verses 6 through 8 are particularly helpful. So if you will, look at Psalm 40 and verse 6 through 8. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burn offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And in verse 6 we see Christ is presented as a willing servant who voluntarily allows his ear to be pierced, which was a mark of servitude. Verse 8 speaks to us of the covenant of redemption. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea. Thy law is within my heart. And now, I want you to compare this with John chapter 6, beginning with verse 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him who sent me, And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up again at the last day. The will which Christ delights to do is defined by God's law, which our Lord kept perfectly. And that law requires two things, perfect obedience in order to obtain a right to eternal life, and secondly, punishment to be inflicted on the guilty sinner. Christ offered himself in order to satisfy the demands of God's holiness and justice. Christ took the guilt of our sins that he might atone for them as an expiatory sacrifice in order to save those whom he came to save. 
Well, I want us to finish this sermon in our next communion service. But I want to try to picture best I can when uh, Barabbas was waiting to be executed. And it was decided by the powers that existed in that time that they would let him go and crucify Christ. And I've often thought about this. Here's our Lord hanging on a cross, suffering agony. And here's a man in the dungeon. And suddenly the door opens. The chains are removed. And they tell him, you're a free man. And he walks through the darkness of the prison and coming to the exit is the bright sunlight and he's a free man. Can you imagine what was going through his mind and heart in those moments? Perhaps, I don't know, perhaps he could look back and see the form of one hanging on a cross. And his thought is this, that should be me. I'm a free man. Can you imagine the thought, the feeling it flowed through him. Someone died in his place. And that's what I want us to be thinking about when we come to the Lord's table here in a few moments. I want you to keep in mind it was Christ who suffered and died for me. In my place condemned he stood. What a glorious and wonderful salvation we have.